Good afternoon, and thank you for joining us today with the Foundation for the Carolinas program with APRA Carolinas on Prospect Development 101. My name is Jessie Herman, and I'm an Assistant Vice President in the Centers for Giving with the Foundation. We are so excited to have so many different nonprofit partners with us today. So if you could, please go ahead and put your organization's name in the chat so we can all see the different missions and programs that are participating. At the Foundation for the Carolinas, our Center for Nonprofit Sustainability is here as your community foundation. We are here to support regional nonprofits through programs like this, fund management and grant raking programs. So if you're interested in learning more about any of those services, my contact information will be in the chat box and please feel free to reach out after the program. We have a great lineup for you today that will cover the basics of prospect development and we'll also have some time for Q&A at the end. Uh, feel free to go ahead and uh, use that Q&A box in the bottom of your screen at any time to submit your questions. And just as a note, this program will be recorded and then posted on the Foundation's website. You know, I think this topic is particularly relevant now as we continue to see philanthropic giving increase year to year, uh, but also see the increased demand for nonprofit services, which as we all know, takes financial capacity to support. So I am really pleased to introduce our presenter for today, Jennifer Vincent. Jennifer is an account executive and former solutions engineer for higher education at Blackbaud, as well as the current president of APRA Carolinas. Prior to joining Blackbaud, she spent most of her career in prospect development at UNC Wilmington. Jennifer worked for years in prospect research before eventually creating and leading their prospect management program. Focused on thought leadership, she's a frequent contributor to blogs, white papers, webinars, and conferences. She loves mountains, being a yarn smith, and utilizing Excel in unique ways. I have to say one of those things is not like the other. I don't often hear people mention Excel as one of their hobbies. <laughs> um, so really looking forward to learning from your expertise today. And at this point, I'm gonna go ahead and turn it over to Jennifer. Thank you, Jesse. And I'm sorry, I, I had to turn my camera off. I'm trying to preserve bandwidth over here to make sure everything goes smoothly. Um, but Excel actually does click into um, this is my, my picture so you can look at me while I'm talking. Um, Excel actually does fit into things with yarn smithing. If anybody out there has done any kind of graphing crochet or um, cross stitching uh, with yarn, you can actually use Excel to create some really neat patterns. Um, and that's one of the, the strange things that I do with Excel. Um, temperature blankets are my new thing where you um, have a different, the temperatures from each day and Excel is pivotal in that. A um, little bit of a pivotal joke there, but um, so thank you so much. I am so excited to be here to talk with you all today. Um, Jesse gave you my intro. Um, I've worked in prospect development at the University of North Carolina Wilmington for about 12 years, coming in in prospect research and then moving over to prospect management. Um, I've been a member of APRA Carolinas uh, for many, many years, and I've been on the board since, I think, 2016. Um, I became president this year, so it's a, just a great um, experience. I absolutely love it, and I am a huge, uh, huge fan of prospect development. Um, as she said, I am working at Blackboard currently. I am an account executive. Um, I also worked previously in sort of the fundraising analytics role, so I love to geek out on anything to do with uh, databases and analytics. So I had a quick agenda for us today, just so we all are on the same page on what we're going to be talking about. Uh, we're gonna do some overviews of APRA and APRA Carolinas. Um, pretty much each one of these different agenda items, I could easily spend an hour talking about. And for some of them, I actually have. So um, if you have questions, about any of this stuff, I am always happy to connect with folks and, and talk about it even more. But we want to go through prospect development terminology, where to find prospects, determining capacity, uh, point out some free resources, discuss metrics, and end with some Excel tips and tricks, which is always super fun. So starting with the overview of APRA, for 30 years, APRA was actually an acronym. Um, it started off as the American Prospect Research Association. And then we picked up some affiliates in Canada and Australia, and I believe the UK, and we then 
rebranded as the Association for Prospect Researchers for Advancement. But as the profession grew, the acronym, it began to lose some of its meaning because it's not just prospect research now. Um, so we kept the word, we turned APRA from an acronym into a word, and it now covers prospect research, prospect management, data analytics, and so much more. Now, APRA Carolinas is a local chapter of the larger APRA International. So um, our chapter is focused on professional development for prospect development professionals um, who are based in North and South Carolina. Our goal is to facilitate education about prospect development, um, act as a central source of information about prospect development. Uh, we like to encourage professional development and networking among our members. And we wanna advance cooperative relationships while supporting and promoting ethical research practices that are often outlined by um, the larger APRA International. So our local chapter provides a huge value at $35 a year. We have two annual conferences. So there's one in the spring, one in the fall. Um, and we offer free virtual content like webinars throughout the year. These past couple of years, our conferences have had to be virtual. Um, with everything, with COVID and everything going down, we've switched to the virtual content. The good thing about that is we have, we offer that content free. Anything that is virtual is free for our members. And we've been able to connect with um, lots of people from across the US. So it hasn't just been the Carolinas. Um, we also offer regular virtual networking opportunities. So you can come in and talk to other people in the profession. Um, it's a great way to really build up your network. And uh, we also offer scholarships and grants. So the 35 a year, if you're not able to, to cover that or your organization won't cover that, we do offer a membership scholarship because our goal is really just to make it easy for you to get the professional development that you want. Um, our road trip grant helps you connect with another individual in North or South Carolina and go talk to them about how they are doing prospect development in their organization. And our professional development scholarship is um, it's a $1,500 scholarship and you can use it towards any professional development at uh, APRA International or here in the Carolinas. So Big APRA or APRA International, um, they offer a large conference in the summer and that conference is, is known as PD. Um, they also have a data analytics symposium and a new researcher symposiums. And these are really great ways to, to really dive in deep on these topics. Um, those symposiums and the annual conference, they do have sometimes heftier price tags, even if it's virtual. Um, so it's a, it's a little expensive to do that, but if you have a new researcher who needs a crash, a crash course, um, it's a great option. They also offer webinars throughout the year, um, and they have webinars that you can purchase on their website. And um, their membership is just under 200 per year. Now, one thing they do offer for free, because there's gotta be something, right? Um, they offer a listserv that's known as Prospect L, or if you have any kind of old school researchers on staff, they call it the L. Um, the L is a great resource for knowledge. Um, so you can go on there and you can search for questions that you have. If you're wondering about prospect management um, or prospect research, you wanna think about a new vendor, um, any kind of questions that you might have, you can post them on the L along with job opportunities. You can scroll through and see other professional development opportunities that are being shared among the chapters and other members. It is free. You don't have to be a member of APRA or APRA Carolinas to join the listserv. Um, so if you are doing any kind of prospect research and you are not currently following Prospect L, I definitely recommend it. So what is prospect development? Um, prospect research is, it, it's also known as development research or fundraising research. And it's a technique through which researchers, development teams, and nonprofits gather relevant information about potential donors. So typical topics of interest include um, figuring out donor capacity, 
philanthropic affinity and due diligence research to make sure that your donors are not going to land you in any kind of legal or ethical trouble. Prospect management brings focus by setting standards like metrics and portfolio assignment standards. So the primary goal of prospect management is to make sure that development is focusing on the right prospects at the right time at the right amount. Now I fell in love with prospect research, but prospect management quickly became my favorite because it encompasses strategy, um, there's relationship building, and you need to be able to pivot from like a 20,000 foot overview to a microscopic view of portfolio and prospects. So this is usually about the point where I start to tell people, visualize looking at a forest and then zoom in on a single tree. That's what prospect management is like. When you're looking at the forest, that's your portfolio. You wanna measure the health of your forest. You wanna look for areas where you may have too many trees or not enough trees, or maybe the wrong kinds of trees are growing in that area. Then you wanna zoom in and look at a single tree. And that's your prospect. Is your tree getting enough water? Are they getting enough light? Does it need to be transplanted to stay healthy? Like, does it need to go to another portfolio? Um, is it ready to move to a larger spot? And I've actually waxed poetic on this analogy for an entire hour-long session. So I'm not going to dive any more into my forests and trees. But prospect management is seeing that forest through the trees while also being able to see the trees. So just kind of changing your view back and forth. And then prospect development is a newer term and it typically refers to the combination of prospect research and prospect management. So it's like one term to encompass both areas. Now looking at some other common terminology, uh, when I'm talking about a prospect, I'm talking about anyone on your radar to make a gift. So um, these, I, I very much encourage you to bucket them into different kinds of prospects. Are they a major gift prospect, a planned gift prospect, an annual gift prospect? But they're anyone who has that capacity to give to your organization. So a portfolio or a portfolio pool refers to the group of prospects that are assigned to an individual development officer. So best practice suggests maintaining a portfolio of about 80 to 100 prospects. And um, that's for a major gift portfolio. And your database is where you should be storing everyone who is connected to your organization. So that's everyone who could be considered your pool of prospects. Um, those who are not actively assigned to development, but uh, who look like good prospects, they're often referred to as leads. Then looking at pipelines, Pipelines is how, um, it's what, it refers to how prospects are moving through a portfolio. So um, think of that funnel and think of your prospect stages, right? So this comes in with prospect management, which is wanting to make sure that prospects are moving from your discovery uh, or identification through to cultivation, then stewardship, and then, uh, or to solicitation, and then finally to your stewardship. Um, when it comes to pipelines, you want to see a fairly even breakdown in stages, right? So you kind of want the same amount of folks in each area of your pipeline because you don't want to see that funnel get clogged. You want to see them move through. Um, so generally, I'll say like 20% in discovery. There's a 40% in cultivation, 20 in early, 20 in late, 20% in stewardship or in solicitation, I'm sorry, and then 20% in stewardship. Um, if you have a prospect who is not going to make another large gift, or really if they are not going to give to you, but their past giving means you want to stay in contact with them, I encourage you all to make sure that you're utilizing a permanent stewardship status for people. Um, it's a way of kind of taking them out of your active pipelines, but also keeping them on the radar so you know you need to check in with them. And then finally, we have data science. And data science is a field that uses scientific methods, processes, algorithms, uh, different systems to extract knowledge and insights from data 
and then to apply that knowledge um, and actionable insights from that data across a broad range of applications. So um, this is often referred to as modeling or scoring. A lot of people will partner with a statistician or a vendor to, to achieve this. Um, common scores are things like uh, you've got your affinity scores, your engagement scores, um, likelihood models, target gift ranges. It's commonly done by running your data through statistical models to look um, for significant variables of similarity that predict some kind of desired outcome. Uh, so if you're looking for major gift donors, right, whatever major gift is at your organization, if you're looking for that kind of a donor, using data to find donors most likely to make a major gift, um, you want to do it by looking at donors who have already made a major gift. So look at the people who have done it and see what they have in common, and then look for those commonalities across your database. So if you've ever done an RFM, so that's like a recency frequency monetary model, that's data science. You're already doing it. Um, I did not do great in algebra, but statistics make a lot of sense to me. And it's, I think it's a lot of fun to really get to know your database and the data in it. If you do have questions throughout, um, if I start to get a little bit nerdy and you have questions, please do not hesitate to reach out and Jesse will, will jump in and let me know. All right, so we're gonna look at where to find prospects. Um, the best place to find prospects is within your donor database. And this is where I put in my, my disclaimer about databases. Uh, my first disclaimer is that Excel is not a database. Excel is a lot of things, um, but a database is not one of them. And the second thing that I always say is garbage in, garbage out. So if you work in databases, you've definitely heard that before. Um, it's important to make sure that you are filling your database with people who are connected to you rather than just a lot of people who have a lot of money. So um, you wanna make sure that they have that desire to interact with your organization. If, um, so in higher education, that's alumni and parents are definitely going in. You want uh, patrons to go in, friends, people who are buying tickets, people who are attending events, anyone who's making donations, all of those people are great to add into your donor database. But that well, um, you know, you're gonna run out of people. Even if you have a large organization, you're always gonna be looking for new prospects, right? You wanna find people who might be new to the area, people who might be um, getting new jobs, who are doing really well and might be interested in your mission. So um, I've put up some news articles from kind of around Charlotte, the triad. Uh, news articles are a great place to look. If you have any kind of local magazine, they often will showcase your local celebrities, which are going to be people who are, who are doing really well and on, um, they're on, they could be on your radar. Board member referrals are a great place to find new prospects. Your board members have a built-in affinity for you. They also are likely dialed in to other people in the community who might, um, your cause might resonate with them. So definitely pull in your board members. Um, event attendees and ticket buyers, of course, they are already engaging with you. Corporate sponsors of similar organizations. So APRA Carolinas looks at the other chapter or see who their sponsors are, and then we invite them to sponsor us. Very, very easy to do. You look for other people who are like you and who is supporting them. Donor honor rolls. So these, you can, uh, you can find these online. Um, there are different ways, different vendors you can partner with. Uh, for instance, NOSA giving searches. They have searchable lists of people who give to different organizations. So you can search for people who have given to other charities in your area or people who have given to similar causes. And that's a great way to find prospects. Um, looking at board members of similar organizations. And then of course your volunteers. So now that you have your prospects, you're gonna want to determine their capacity. Um, so capacity, capacity means uh, the money that a person has on hand to contribute philanthropically. So 
it does not mean that they will give that amount away. It's just a best guess at the amount of money that they could contribute. So generally capacities are over a five year period. But again, it also refers to all of the money that they have to give to any organization over that five year period. So if someone is rated with a capacity of 100 to $150,000, uh, $100, sorry, $100,000 to $150,000, um, it means that they have the ability to give that amount away to any charity over five years. Um, if your, so if your major gift threshold is at like $25,000 and you see someone who gives to a lot of different organizations and their major gift capacity is just at that $25 range, it's going to be really hard to convince them to make a major gift at your organization and not give anywhere else for those five years. So you want to make sure you have that really tight uh, connection with them. And capacities are, they're built by assessing a prospect's wealth. So everything really is a best guess because there's no way to know everything about a donor's wealth. Things like bank accounts, credit card balances, stuff like that is not publicly available, but a lot of information is publicly available. So for instance, um, you can assess property records via the county assessor to find out how much they paid for their house. And then you can kind of estimate what their mortgage payments look like to get, if you're trying to figure out what their income is. Um, you can also look at how much they pay for their taxes annually, which can give you an estimation as well. It can often lead you down a rabbit hole. So you might find that they own property through a limited liability company, an LLC, which means you're now gonna go look at the Secretary of State to dive into their LLC and see uh, what that company is for, search for other properties that are owned through that LLC. So it might be an investment uh, property ownership company, you know, and they might own it straight out without any partners or anything like that. So it's a great way, property records are a great way to dive down the rabbit hole and really connect a lot of puzzle pieces. Um, often, Organizations do partner with vendors to have wealth screenings for their database or portions of their database to determine the wealth capacity of their donors. Um, again, their tools are searching publicly available records. They're just serving it up in a much easier way to digest because it's all you search for your prospect and then everything is right there for you in their record. So instead of having to search every county in the US to see if your prospect has a vacation home, the aggregators of data will search through it and then deliver those assets and a capacity estimation. Now the standard out of the box rating is generally 5% of all known physical assets. So that's your real estate, that's your publicly held stock, um, art valuations, physical property. If you know the private company valuations, really out of the box, they say 5% is, is the estimation over five years. There are different formulas that you can use that take into account different factors, like the prospect's age, um, their marital status, whether or not they have kids. Uh, you can often find these custom formulas by posting on Prospect L and ask people what formula they use because prospect researchers love to share their knowledge. Um, I know I used kind of a, a graded, capacity formula that took into account their age because you want to hit them when they're at sort of a sweet spot, they're settled in their career, they're settled with their bills, they have a little extra income because their kids aren't super young. Um, and you can, you can do that, you can set that up yourself. But the standard has and continues to be 5% of known assets. But remember, my disclaimer, this is to um, everywhere over five years. So you wanna make sure that you're a priority. And to zero in on prospects with a higher likelihood to donate at a specific level, organizations will often use data science. And again, they partner with a vendor or a statistician to create data models. Now these models, like I said before, are looking for similarities among your donors who are giving to your organization 
to find those statistically significant predictors. So by using your data models, you're able to rank and rate the prospects in your database to determine that those that are most likely to make like a major gift or an annual gift or a planned gift, any kind of gift, but they're most likely to make one to you. So it's a really great way to segment your database. So you're soliciting the right prospects at the right amount. And with custom models, um, the scores and the gift ranges are catered to your organization. So I'm gonna score very low in certain philanthropic databases because I have no connection to them or giving history or anything. But I'm also gonna rate very high in others because of my past support um, with their organization and the way that I engage with them. Now the best capacity formula and data models are nothing without prospect research. So prospect researchers are specially trained to see the data and use it to determine who really is your best prospect. Um, if you aren't able to partner with a company or a well screen or data modeling or any of that, prospect researchers are the ones who are going out and finding this information. It is labor intensive work. So if you know that a prospect has a vacation home somewhere, um, and you are not the one doing prospect research, make sure that your prospect researcher knows that they have, um, you know, they've got a house on Wrightsville Beach or they have a mountain home in Asheville. It makes it so much easier if you are out there searching county by county. Um, that way you're not having to go on and just go and blindly search for these. So the main factor in a good donor is not only how much wealth they have, but are they philanthropic? And more importantly, are they philanthropic to you? So I can put Elon Musk in my database and he is going to be at the top of my capacity screenings, but he's not gonna give me anything because he, he has no connection to me. He's not supporting my mission. He's philanthropic, he's wealthy, but he doesn't, he doesn't care about me. So wealth isn't the only indicator for that. You also need to look at their philanthropic tendencies. Most wealth capacity vendors include philanthropic contributions as a part of their services because it is so widely known that you need wealth and philanthropy. Um, these contribution databases, again, are all publicly available data. So they're out there scraping the internet looking for the donor honor rolls and then tying it back to your prospect. It does mean it's something that you can do, but again, it is time consuming. You want to see a prospect who has a steady giving, a steady uh, giving history to your organization and maybe even to other organizations with similar causes. So um, me personally, I am pretty sure that every animal shelter out there knows that if they send me a picture and a story like it has a dog or a cat on it and it tells me, you know, about the neglect of this animal, I am going to respond. Uh, environmental causes, they know it too. But if Harvard sends me a solicitation, I am not going to respond. It's not because I don't like Harvard. It's not that I don't think that higher education is important. I mean, it's like literally my life's work. But I don't have an expressed affinity for Harvard and I'm going to continue to support where I went to school and where I worked for over a decade. But if Harvard looked at my philanthropic tendencies and targeted me for a gift to a program that simultaneously saves orphaned animals and it saves the environment, I mean, they're going to get a gift. It's just going to happen. So, um, as I mentioned, this is normally something that is delivered back from a vendor, but this information is out there in the donor honor rolls, which means you can search for it too. So determining capacity by finding philanthropy. Um, you can Google donor honor rolls and your prospect's name, and I do encourage you to add in location, especially as you're first searching, and see what you can find. So a few Google tips, um, try their name in a variety of ways. If they're married, try their names together and try them separately. Use their location to figure out um, 
like charities that are that are near them. So uh, if you know that they live in Charlotte, you know, you want to put Charlotte, North Carolina on there. Um, basically, you want to kind of put everything together and try to figure out how their names generally appear on honor rolls. So are you seeing them appear as Mr. and Mrs. Doe, John and Jane Doe, Dr. Jane Doe, Mr. John Doe? Um, whatever it is, they will, if they are large givers to organizations, they often have their names show up the same way across donations. Um, now, the way I have it written on the slide is an example of a way that you can do uh, a more advanced Google search. So it's sort of like saying donor honor roll with John Doe or Jane Doe or John and Jane Doe, etc. Um, it saves you time because you can run one search and then dig through the results and narrow the scope once you find what you're looking for. I actually did create an Excel spreadsheet to do this for me where I would just put in their names and nicknames and it would aggregate it into a Boolean search that I can then put into Google. Um, I don't know that it was the best use of time, but it was really fun to make. Uh, and Google is your friend for finding these honor rolls, but it can feel like an enemy uh, when you're searching for a common name. A um, Couple of ways that you can do it. So when you go on Google, you can go over to the little gear on the side and dive into advanced search that way. Or you can Google advanced search techniques for Google and they should help you out. Other free resources. Um, a lot of what we do in prospect research is actually free and widely available on the web. So when you're partnering with a vendor, you're doing so because they are the ones scraping the web for you and offering up the results. And it's brilliant and it's a huge, it's a huge time saver but most of the information that they're providing is publicly available if you search hard enough for it. Um, this past February, we actually, Upper Carolinas did a blog post which talked about our uh, board members' favorite free resources because we all have a hidden gem or two in our pockets. Um, like there was one time that I actually searched for people in my area who owned airplanes by using an FAA website for registered planes. My thinking there was people who own planes are wealthy. Let's see who lives in the area with an airplane. They're bound to be wealthy. And it was fantastic. I found a lot of private companies and LLCs that I didn't know about. Um, and I found a lot of people who owned planes that, that live nearby or they lived in other areas, but they had a plane here. I don't know that the ROI was worth it on that project because it was very time consuming but I certainly enjoyed it a lot. Um, so we have the link to the blog post on there. There are also very large directories available via the Helen Brown Group and Aspire Research Group. These are also really good resources for prospect, uh, for prospect development, but their links directories, they have all kinds of stuff. Your GIS, um, county real estate, Secretary of State websites, all kinds of stuff that you might need. And that way you're just bookmarking one link instead of, I don't know, hundreds of them. Um, under the individual links, these are just a few. I actually pulled them out of our blog post to present them here. Um, SEC filings, tax assessor, like you can find the different county taxes on that one website. Searching for UNC system or North Carolina state employee salaries. That's a good one for us in this state in North Carolina. Um, the Open Wealth, uh, the Wealth Open Data Dashboard. My buddy Steve Grimes created that. He's up in New York, but it's actually a very useful tool if you're prospecting for wealthy people. Um, and of course, Giving in 990s, you can dive into Foundation 990s to get a lot of uh, information about where they are giving grants, where money is going, whether or not your mission fits into that. And there's a lot that you can do um, on these sites. So switching gears from research to metrics is like stepping from uh, prospect research into prospect management. Um, so we're going to start talking about metrics. Uh, my number one advice with metrics is always measure what you want to improve. 
So the reasoning for this is that when metrics are applied to your job, you are going to focus more on what is being measured than what is not measured. So if you decide that activity, such as the number of activities that are recorded in the database is your top metric, um, get ready because you are going to see a lot of left voicemail activity showing up. And I know this from personal experience. Um, same with meetings. If you measure development performance based on the number of meetings, you will see an increase in meetings. But you might see that they're taking the same person out to lunch twice a month or just checking in with the same people over and over. Um, because, you know, a lot of times development enjoys spending time with certain prospects. And uh, when that happens, um, if you're looking at the metrics for meetings, it checks a box. You know, it puts a meeting on there in their metrics. Um, so instead, you might want to focus on number of unique meetings. So that's the first time they're meeting with a prospect or uh, the number of times that they may have met with particular prospects over the course of the year. This is going to tell you much more about discovery and cultivation work, um, as well as how much time that you're spending or development is spending with a particular prospect. And again, you want to focus on what you want to improve. So portfolio penetration is a great metric. Um, say your development director is assigned to 100 prospects in a rolling year, how many have they met with? 75, you've got a 75% penetration rate. Um, looking at the number and value of solicitations. Now, of course, this is gonna bear, it's gonna vary uh, based on portfolio sizes and solicitation sizes. Um, for me, when I was setting up the metrics for this, I did a five-year analysis of giving at particular levels in order to figure out what metric is achievable, as well as like have a little bit of, of a stretch on there. Um, I also really like to use the number of solicitations that are made because it encourages development to enter in proposals and opportunities on all of their solicitations, not just the ones that they commit. And the importance there is you get to see what a person is saying yes to, but you also get to see what a person is saying no to, which is very valuable, especially when you're gonna make the next solicitation. Um, looking at the number and value of commitments. Now this is gonna vary as well, but you want to focus on the number of commitments coming through the door. And you also wanna know what value, have like a goal for your development directors, um, a goal and the value that they should be raising each year. And then one of my favorites to play with are conversion rates because there's so many different ways that you can look at conversion rates. So looking at how many solicitations turn into commitments can tell you a lot about how a development officer works. Um, it can kind of give you insight into if they're soliciting too fast, are they soliciting the same amount over and over without considering what the prospect could commit to? Um, for instance, say a development director makes uh, 20 solicitations each year and it gets 19 commits. So that's 95% conversion, right? So maybe they're playing it a little too safe because pretty much everyone has said yes to their solicitation. Conversely, if you have a development director who makes 40 solicitations in a year with only 19 commits, that's less than 50%, right? So they might be soliciting too fast. So you wanna look at, at those different conversion rates um, because it will give you that insight into their portfolios. So quick example, um, I'm gonna refer to uh, the case. The first one is, is on the left and the second one is on the right. And this is just kind of a way to lay out some of the metrics that you can look at. You don't need to look at all of these, but I just wanted to give you an idea on why relying on maybe like average ask amount is not the best metric. Um, so in these tables, mean, of course, is your average. And your average is where you add up all of the solicitation amounts and then divide by the number that there are. Um, so the total amount, the 909 divided by the 15 number of solicitations. So the first one um, says that the average ask amount is 60,600. 
Well, that's not really true. It's a bit skewed because you have that one 500,000 ask, but all of the rest of them are much lower. So the 60,000 is giving you an idea that their ask amount is a lot higher um, on average than it actually is. The median metric on here, so for a median, what they do, what Excel does is it lines up all of the solicitations in a row from like least to most, and it takes the value in the middle. So that's your median metric. So what this can tell you is kind of where somebody falls. If you know what their top ask is and their bottom ask is, if the median is really close to the bottom, you know that you're seeing more of those low dollar solicitations. And then that mode metric, that's your most. That's the one that they ask for more than any of the others. Um, often it's your baseline for major gifts, but you do want to see a variation in those ask amounts. And you can look for that by using these figures. So the second um, graphic, <laughs> Excel clip or whatever, um, it shows that same high median or that same high average, your mean, but your median is it's a better value because it's a bit above that baseline. Um, but then looking at the conversion rates, their conversion numbers are the same. So that conversion number is how many solicitations have turned into commitments. And it's at a 67%, which is fine. Um, but your conversion dollars, now the one on the right, uh, the that one has the 99% conversion dollars. That's really nice. That means that Jane Doe has really taken the time to figure out what her prospects can do, uh, what they're likely to do, and she's soliciting at a really good value for her prospects. Um, however, the one on the left, the conversion dollar of 103%, that one has me a little nervous because what that means is that Jane Doe's prospects are actually committing to more than she's asking for, which tells me she's leaving money on the table. So looking at um, looking at the same data, but just kind of breaking it down different ways can really give you the insight into uh, the health of your solicitations and the performance of your development staff. So as I said before with metrics, um, research has shown that you can only maintain about 100 relationships in your life. And these are your colleagues, your family, your friends, and also your prospects. So keeping major gift portfolios down to 80 to 100 is really your sweet spot to focus development staff. And then looking down at your prospect statuses, I kind of broke down um, what I like to see, which is sort of my, I call it my rule of 20s because I like to break cultivation into an early and a late so I can really see where they're moving through the pipeline. Um, but you just want to see that even flow through the pipeline for your prospect status. And then speaking of uh, prospect statuses, I wanted to share with you all, um, this was a document that I created for my development team just to really outline each of the stages, um, the amount of time that you can spend in each stage, and then the key questions that need to be answered before you move forward. The idea here is that um, when a prospect is in discovery, development has about three months to move them to either qualify them and move them into cultivation or disqualify them and remove assignment. Your key questions um, under discovery, you need to be able to answer yes to all of them. And then you can move down to the next stage. The circuit breaker column, um, that is, it's, it's kind of like a flip that you could switch that will either keep the prospect in the current status or send them back a status. So it just means that there's something that needs to be addressed. And if it's not addressed, you can't move forward. So for instance, cultivation late, if you don't have a proposal strategy um, or if you have a proposal strategy that can't be implemented in the uh, time frame, you can't move into solicitation.
And then Excel tips and tricks. Um, so we did have a blog on this at Upper Carolinas. We also have pre-recorded sessions. This past year, we've done kind of a lineup of uh, Excel tips and tricks. We started with a 101, um, took that into, uh, we went a bit deeper diving into some of the different functionalities in Excel uh, with pivot tables. And then we also did a big session on actually making dashboards with Excel. Um, all of those are pre-recorded and available for our members on our website. Um, I did have a tips and tricks blog, so it's hyperlinked on here. Um, you'll get it with the slides. And um, these are just a few of the things that I wanted to point out on here. Um, count a is a very useful um, Excel formula if you just wanna find how many cells are not blank in a particular area. So this is like, if you wanna count how many proposals you have. Um, conditional formatting is, it's a great way to find duplicates. It's a great way if you have any kind of scores on your prospects, you can apply conditional formatting to make certain scores like a stoplight. Um, filters are a very easy way to quickly narrow down your lists. Um, I am a huge fan of using filters. Uh, XLOOKUP is the newer and better version of VLOOKUP. If you've ever done anything with VLOOKUP, you know how finicky it is. It has to be in a very particular area. It has to pull data a very particular way. XLOOKUP is more like, um, I, <laughs> it's almost like Excel saying, I understand what you're trying to do. Here's your data. Um, anytime you have two lists that you're trying to merge with a common, like an ID number or something, XLOOKUP is your best friend. And uh, pivot tables. My biggest thing with pivot tables is do not be afraid of them. Um, they are a very powerful way to quickly condense lots of data um, and then show it in a meaningful way. So don't be afraid of pivot tables. Um, I did have an Excel presentation kind of part of this that I was going to dive into, but I think we are getting pretty close to the Q&A time. Um, Jesse, do we have some questions out there that we should get to? We do. We've got a couple of questions that have already been submitted if we want to go ahead and move to that section or if you want to close out first. Oh, sure. Stop. You want me to stop the share? Oh, I just mean if you wanted to run through those final slides and then move to Q&A. Oh, okay. Do we have time for that? Sure. Yeah, let's give it about two, three more minutes and then we'll open up for questions. Okay, can do. Um, so instead of doing a pre-recorded, um, let me see if I can, I'm going to do a stop share. I'm going to pull up my Excel very quickly and just see if I can share with you guys um, a couple of basic things that we can do. Okay. Jesse, are we good with the Excel spreadsheet? Beautiful. <laughs> Excellent. Thank you. Um, <laughs> so my, my silly tip that I always have, this drives me nuts, is you're scrolling down a large spreadsheet of data. Always make sure you come up to view, freeze panes, freeze the top row. That way it falls with you wherever you're going. The filters, if you come over here to the far left corner and you put a click right there, if you go to data, filter, you can now filter by each of these columns by whatever is in the column. So if you wanna look at your first gift fund, pull your filter down, you can uncheck select all and pick a particular fund and say, okay. And now you see your list has gone from 1,624 to 254 records. So it's a very easy way to narrow down to see just the gifts in that fund. You can also do really cool things on your date field, where if you pull down the date, you can see you can check off different years, you can check off months within years, or you can go to like date filters and say date filter after, and just put in a particular date. So you wanna find everyone who's after October 1st of this year, okay, you find the one fund. When you're done with your filters, you can either clear them 
or you can just click the filter again and it'll turn everything off. You can also go back over here to the corner, click that, insert, pivot table. It's gonna give you your table range. This is the where your data is. So this is just the sheet of data and you wanna put it on a new worksheet and say, okay. So now you have your pivot table here on the side. You've got your four different areas down here to work with. Um, these up here, these are all of your different columns. So it's all of the data from that spreadsheet. Let's grab the latest gift fund and pull it into rows. So now we can see these are all of the different funds attached to the latest gift. You can come over here and say latest gift amount, pull it into values, and now we have the sum of the latest gift. But we don't know if it's one gift in the alumni building fund, 10 gifts. We know that it's a million, but we don't know how many it was. So you can grab your latest gift amount, pull it back down here. You see your data is duplicated. You need to come back to where the value is, the value field settings, and say count. And now you can see how many gifts were made to make the sum of the gifts. Um, you can also change this. I'm gonna right click, format cells, and select currency. And because I don't like decimal places when I'm looking at big data, I took the decimal places away and say, okay. And now you can see all of your data on here, how many gifts made up the amount, but we're not quite done. Jesse said I had another minute. Um, let me throw assigned to up here in the filters. So now we see all of the latest gifts, the amount that each fund had, the amount of gifts that went into them. Let's see how many of them are assigned to Hampton. And now we have a list here. Let's see how many are, I'm gonna go back up, I'm gonna select all solicitors. So it takes you back to, to everything. You can see all of your different funds again. Let's see the blank ones. So these are your folks who are not assigned, um, who have made gifts. If we're looking at our capital projects for athletics row here, we see we have 360. Maybe we're trying to raise funds. 360 people, their latest gift amount went to this fund. They raised this much. Let's find that list. I am going to double click on this 360 and that's gonna create a spreadsheet. And these are my prospects who are not assigned, who are supporting my fund. Um, how's that? That is great. Thank you, Jennifer. I, I love the comments about the spreadsheet. Um, <laughs> I think we have some <laughs> folks contacting us afterwards to get a template of this, <laughs> uh, but really handy and useful to see. Thanks for sharing that. So moving into questions, change gears just a little bit. Um, we have a great question about wealth screening. Uh, you know, when we consider these different tools and software, at what point should, you know, a small nonprofit start utilizing those, particularly those paid services? Is that beneficial? Should they wait till they hit a certain threshold? That's a great question. Um, you know, it really, if you have a thousand people in your database, a wealth screening is probably not going to be cost effective for you. Um, but you can also, you know, narrow, no, it's just not really gonna be cost effective at a thousand, um, but it does come down to your ROI, right? So um, it takes that calculation of how many people are in your database, how many of them are actively donating to you. Um, this is something that, you know, it's, it's great to talk to other smaller organizations to see what they're doing. Um, I have certainly helped a lot of smaller places with projects. Um, it just really depends. <laughs> I hate to say, oh, it depends. There's not really a threshold because you might have a thousand very wealthy people in your database. And at that point, knowing at what level to target them, I mean, that really does make the difference. So I have to say it depends and I, I'm sorry but I'll talk to you more about it if you have questions. <laughs> you know, I think that's an answer we find a lot just in the nonprofit realm because there are such a variety of sizes and missions. Um, Absolutely. So, a little bit more of a topical question regarding COVID-19 and the pandemic. How has that changed how you do prospect development? 
Oh, so a lot of changes. Um, one of the great things with COVID from what I've seen with the research that I've read and, and the different reports that I've seen, people are still donating. They are still giving. Um, we saw a lot of support come out, especially to organizations that were um, really impacted with COVID. We've seen a lot of support come out, but we've also seen a lot of places, I mean, museums took such a big hit um, because people can't come in and you can't engage as well. So it's, it is a big change in how, um, in how people are giving, but wealth didn't get hit as hard as, as most people expected. There, of course, have been a lot of job changes. So tracking where, uh, where your people have gone, where your big prospects have gone. Um, in higher education, that means alumni are getting better jobs faster because there's remote positions that were not available before. Um, and the wealth is still there. I think the uncertainty has, has you know, tapped tap down a bit. People aren't as uncertain now. They feel more comfortable, uh, especially with the ability to transition jobs. So we are seeing an uptick in giving. Um, prospect management wise, you have to pivot right? And you have to count things as meetings that didn't previously count as meetings. Phone calls can be solicitations now. Um, stuff doesn't have to be done in person. You can count virtual meetings as actual meetings. Um, so there's, there's a lot of changes there. Certainly. And you talked about how APRA Carolinas looks at other chapters to see maybe who sponsors them to reach out. So a great question we have from the audience is, how do you initiate that reach out? <laughs> I, so I am always very open. I don't, I don't have a very good poker face. I'm very much like, hi, my name is Jennifer Vincent. I'm the president of APRA Carolinas. I see you are a sponsor at APRA Maryland, and I'm wondering if you are interested in getting involved with our organization. Um, it's always great to have your elevator pitch, you know, your, your bullet points of who your membership is, why the sponsor would want to get involved with you. So, you know, you always want to make it seem advantageous for them to join. And it's, you know, upper chapters, everybody's doing a fantastic job, uh, especially during the pandemic. So it's pretty easy to say, you know, I've seen some of their great programming. We invite you to check out ours. Um, yeah. So I hope that answers your question. Great. And now that we've got uh, just, you know, a minute or two left, I'm going to leave you with our biggest question. Um, ah. how, how do you approach DEI data? When we think about diversity, equity, and inclusion, are those things you're factoring into prospect research? And, and how do you do that? Oh, so we're going to need more than a couple of minutes for that one. <laughs> that is an excellent topic. And it's something that is definitely top of mind. Um, it's tough, right? So especially if you're partnering with companies, you want to make sure that it is something that they are paying attention to um, with, with the company itself, that they are being inclusive and, and looking at the data from different perspectives. Um, with regard to your organization, I mean, a lot of this comes down to leadership support. And I would say the biggest thing especially when talking to other prospect researchers and prospect managers, the biggest thing is sitting down with your leadership and having a very frank conversation with them about the importance of it. And um, there are lots of great programs out there. I know APRA has got, um, I think, an entire segment on DEI and other other webinars are out there that can really dive into it and be more helpful than I can in, in a minute. Um, but the biggest takeaway is to make sure that you and leadership are on the same page and that it becomes a focus for your area. Sure. And I lied. I actually have one more question. Uh, so <laughs> our last question from the audience, you talked a little bit about balancing, uh, from a development director's perspective, balancing your relationship with your prospect, whether you treat it entirely professionally or you kind of cross that boundary to establish those personal relationships. In your experience, you know, what have organizations done and what, what do you recommend? So I don't think that there's anything wrong with 
connecting personally with your prospects, I think um, it's a really great way to establish that connection. Uh, you know, as you know, I'm in a vendor role, but I have, I am the contact for a lot of friends. And um, I like to treat everybody that way. And I was the same way in prospect development with prospects. The more I got to know about them and the more I shared with them, the better off our mission was a, we were able to communicate our mission. Um, I would say the, the boundary line of course would be, um, you don't wanna date a prospect. Uh, it's not a good idea. I've, I've been around, I've seen it, it's not good. Um, and if you're going to hang out with your prospects, you know, don't, don't really count those as actions. Don't put it in your metrics. Um, it's going to come down to each organization on, on how they feel about that. Just be upfront with, um, with people. But, you know, I've certainly put friends into portfolios for development staff members because they were able to better work with that person because they had that personal relationship. Yeah, I think that's great advice. Um, and we've we've got a lot of takeaways from today's session and thank you for that kind of rapid fire Q&A. Um, but we really appreciate you taking the time to come and talk to us today. Uh, I certainly learned some new information and tips. I hope our audience found this useful as well. Um, as I said, this will be recorded and sent out. We will have the slides available for you as well so you can use all of those fantastic hyperlinks. Um, uh, thank you for joining us. We certainly hope to see you in person next year at some of Foundation for the Carolinas nonprofit seminar series events, and we hope that you have a great day. Thanks so much. Thank you. Thanks, everyone.